Before you watch this video, please be aware that it involves topics such as harm and violence towards a minor. If you find the discussion of this topic distressing, please click out of this video and safeguard your mental health. In the heart of the quiet community of Homosassa, Florida, a chilling crime unfolded in 2005 that captured the nation's attention and left an indelible mark on the collective memory of the country. Jessica Lunsford, a nine-year-old girl with an infectious smile and dreams larger than life itself, vanished without a trace from her family home, sparking a massive search and a media frenzy that would reveal a tale as heart-wrenching as it was horrifying. As days turned into agonizing weeks, the hope of finding Jessica alive dwindled, leaving her family and the wider community grappling with the unbearable possibility of never seeing her again. The discovery of her body, buried where nobody would expect, brought a tragic end to the search and unveiled a monstrous betrayal by someone the community had never suspected. The murderer, living unnoticed within their midst, confessed to the crime, leading to widespread outrage. So much so that an entire law, colloquially known as Jessica's Law, would have to be put in place in order to prevent something like this happening ever again. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Now, let's lift the thin veil. Jessica Lunsford was born on the 6th of October, 1995, in North Carolina. She was a bright student who enjoyed singing, playing with her stuffed animals, attending church, and riding motorcycles with her father. Her parents, Mark and Angie, had split up when she was just one and her mother moved to Ohio, where she remarried and had a son. Mark relocated to Homosassa, Florida, to be near his aging parents and provide Jessica with proper care while he worked as a dump truck driver. Her mother was not able to see Jessica, often due to the distance. The Lunsford home, which consisted of grandparents Ruth and Archie Lunsford, her father Mark Lunsford, Jessica, and their family dog, a Dachshund named Corky, was a trailer on South Sonata Avenue. Known for her radiant smile and quiet demeanor, those close to Jessica described her as friendly yet quiet. She had a particular fear of the dark and always slept with a nightlight and flashlight by her bed. Her grandmother noted that she was very particular about her room and didn't like people entering without permission. Jessica shared a close bond with her father and often went for motorcycle rides with him or sang karaoke at a popular local restaurant every weekend. Her father used to lovingly call her Jess and said, quote, We were more than father and daughter. We were best friends, remarking that they often competed about who loved each other more. Jessica was excited about one day being able to pursue a career in fashion design or music. She also used to dream of becoming an Olympic swimmer one day. As with a lot of little girls, Jessica used to love dolls and stuffed animals and had a room filled with them. One of her favorite possessions was a purple stuffed dolphin that her father had won for her at a fair just a few weeks before the incident. She took it to bed with her every night since. On the night of the 23rd of February in 2005, Jessica's day was like any other for a nine-year-old. She attended school, ran errands with her grandparents, and went to a church function with her family friend, Sharon Armstrong. The evening was relatively routine as she prepared for her upcoming youth group competition, where she, along with her team, would recite verses from the Bible. Her father had not yet returned home from work when she arrived back at 9pm, so she settled into her room, snacking on her favorite chips and watching cartoons on TV. Eventually, her father arrived home and they spent some quality time together. Him indulging in her energetic antics as she jumped on the sofa and he tried to get in some time to relax and watch some TV. Later that night, he decided to head off to spend the rest of the night at his girlfriend's house. Jessica's grandmother, Ruth, tucked her into bed with her beloved stuffed purple dolphin and soon drifted off to sleep herself. The next morning, Mark returned home at 5.45am to get ready for work. He heard Jessica's alarm going off but didn't give it much thought initially. As he got dressed, he noticed the alarm was still blaring and decided to check on Jessica in her room. To his horror, she was not in her bed and neither was her cherished purple dolphin. Her school uniform was neatly laid out for the next day, adding to the confusion. 
Mark frantically searched the small trailer but found no trace of Jessica anywhere. Panic set in as he woke Ruth up and enlisted her help in searching for their missing granddaughter. The only sign of anything unusual was an L-shaped cut in the screen door of the back porch. Police were immediately called and a massive search effort began to find little Jessica who had vanished without a trace. Deputy Juan Santiago was the first to arrive at the scene. He conducted a preliminary search of the property before calling for backup. Jessica's family had a set of her fingerprints and they would hand them to the deputies. Soon, a large group of police and media descended upon the Lunsford trailer, utilizing all sorts of resources including police dogs, helicopters, ATVs, and even officers on horseback. A nationwide missing children's alert was issued, describing Jessica as 4 feet 11 inches, tall with brown hair and brown eyes. Unfortunately, an amber alert couldn't be issued without any information about a possible vehicle or evidence of danger. Immediately, after Jessica was reported missing, authorities and volunteers began combing the area in search of her. Bloodhounds were brought in to pick up her scent, and even a neighbor's dog named Bufford joined in the search efforts. A dive team was assembled to search nearby bodies of water. The initial focus of the search was a dense wooded area surrounding Jessica's home. But despite their best efforts, no clues were found. Little did they know, the answer to Jessica's disappearance was much closer than they thought. One of the first steps of the search effort was to check on all known sex offenders in the area, a standard procedure for missing children's cases. In their investigation, detectives discovered that one offender, John Evander Cui, had not been living at his registered address. Rather, he was staying at his sister Dorothy Dixon's trailer near the Lunsford family home. Cui had a lengthy criminal record and was a habitual user of crack cocaine. Past charges against him included burglary, weapons possessions, intoxication, DUI, indecent exposure, disorderly conduct, fraud, insufficient funds, and larceny. His driver's license had also been revoked for 99 years. A real role model for society. Cui did have a dark past, however, which should not be ignored. His friends and relatives described his upbringing as troubled, marked by abuse and neglect that caused him to develop a distorted sense of morality. He never really had a stable home growing up, and often had to scavenge for food in garbage cans and sleep on the streets or in old cars just to survive. Born prematurely on the 19th of August 1958 to his teenage mother Betty Irene Harris, aged around 15, and his father John William Cooey, aged 21. Their marriage did not last long, as Betty left due to domestic violence when John was only a year old. She moved to Gainesville, Florida with her parents while John Jr. and his sister Dorothy Marie frequently changed living arrangements. Eventually, their mother remarried and the children went with her for a while. Koei struggled in school due to learning difficulties and was often teased for his protruding ears and shy demeanor. His uncle shared that he always tried to protect Kui and his sister from bullies on the school bus. However, even Kui's stepfather, Bobby Lindsay, would sometimes ridicule him, such as once nearly drowning him in a pond as a form of punishment. Kui would continue to endure frequent physical abuse throughout his childhood. He wouldn't go much into detail about the abuse, but once briefly mentioned one traumatic incident in which he wet the bed. For that, his stepfather punished him by pressing his head between his bedroom door and the wall. His stepfather and mother would later deny all the stories about this abuse. Cooey and his sister were eventually sent to live with his paternal family near Orlando, where the abuse continued until they were moved again, this time to live with an aunt. In a more stable environment at his aunt's house, Cooey began to improve with the help of his older cousin, Linda Arnett, who taught him better communication skills. However, the trauma he had experienced eventually led him to become an abuser himself. The first time it happened, Linda recalls dozing off while sitting on the couch and waking up to find Cooey attempting to undress her when he was just eight years old. She ran to tell her mother, but instead of contacting any type of help, her mother's solution was to simply send Cooey away. Most of his life during his childhood is not known as he would continue to move from place to place. While his family members covered up his vices, he dropped out of school at 16 and found out he was on his own. So he filled his life with drug and alcohol abuse, constantly jumping from one job to another. Despite his young age, he always appeared older than he actually was. 
At the age of 18, Kui stood at only 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed a meager 120 pounds. His right arm bore a tattoo of a star, while his left proudly displayed his zodiac sign, a Leo. A 3 inch scar above his right eye served as a reminder of the difficult childhood he had endured. By the time Kui was 19, he had already encountered trouble with the law. One night, in a drunken state, he broke into a young girl's bedroom window and covered her mouth with his hand, with plans to abduct her. Luckily, she managed to escape and ran to her mother for help. Upon being caught by the police, Kui confessed to his actions. In a letter to his lawyer, written in neat handwriting, he acknowledged that he had mental health issues and asked for assistance in overcoming them. He explained that he had seen a doctor when he was younger and multiple psychiatrists had diagnosed him with a mental illness, but nothing came out of it. As punishment for his crime, Koi was sentenced to 10 years in prison and ordered to undergo an assessment. This is where a psychologist determined that Koi's IQ was only slightly higher than mild cognitive impairment, but no help was recommended to him. After serving almost two years in prison, Koi was released by the parole board due to good behavior. With nowhere else to go, he returned to Wilcox, near his childhood home, to live with his estranged mother and stepfather. He was 21 at the time. During his time there, one night, he crawled into his stepsister's bed and tried to sexually assault the five-year-old girl while she slept. Her older sister Terry would catch Koi in the act. Koei's mother would later go on to say that he had tried to rape Melody and that if Terry hadn't woken up, he would have succeeded. The next morning, they took him to the parole officer in Gainesville. At the time, Koei told the police, quote, I wasn't going to hurt them. My daddy and I do this all the time. The parole officer simply ordered Koei to leave his mother's house, but did not file a report. His mother gave him a stern look before he left and said, you should forget you have a mother, because your mother is dead. In 1985, Kui married Karen, Joe, and Gosh. Karen would become pregnant with his child soon after. After years of turmoil, their marriage ended in 1990, when she discovered he had sexually assaulted her daughter. Again, no one called 911. About a year later, at age 33, Kui committed the crime that would officially label him as a sex offender. He was convicted of sexually assaulting a five-year-old girl who lived a few doors down from his residence in Kissimmee, Florida. Facing a long prison sentence, Kui once again pleaded for help. He told officers at the time that he didn't think prison would help him, and he needs to get help for himself. After serving only a few years in prison, Kui was once again released for good behavior. His criminal record was mistakenly misplaced by parole officers at one point. Additionally, Kui failed to attend sex offender treatment sessions and eventually slipped off the radar of authorities. That is, until Jessica Lunsford disappeared. As detectives dug deeper into Kui's whereabouts, they learned that he had moved in with his half-sister, Dorothy Dixon, 47. Also residing at Dixon's trailer were her boyfriend, Matthew Dittrich, 31, and her daughter and son-in-law, Maddie Secord, 27, and Jean Secord, 35, and Dorothy's two-year-old grandson, Joshua. This trailer was a mere 65 yards away from the Lunsford home. When detectives arrived at Dorothy Marie Dixon's residence, they discovered Dorothy, her boyfriend, and her daughter inside. They were questioned about the whereabouts of John, but denied knowing anything about his location or that he had been living with them. The Sheriff of Citrus County, Jeff Dossie, later described the residents of the trailer as addicts and drug users. The detectives conducted a brief search of the property, looking for any signs of Kui or Jessica. Unfortunately, they did not check the closet in the room of where Kui had been staying and where she was still being kept, alive. Nearly three weeks after Jessica Lunsford was reported missing, authorities returned to Dixon's home on March 14th. They searched the trailer once again and this time found blood on the mattress in Kui's former bedroom. Suddenly, Kui became a person of interest in the case. The search for Kui intensified, but the residents of the trailer continued to claim they had no knowledge of his whereabouts. In reality, he had fled the area two weeks earlier with a bus ticket, purchased under an alias. He ended up in Savannah, Georgia. Kui's stay in Savannah was short-lived, 
as he was questioned by police for a possible marijuana possession violation. However, unaware of Florida's interest in him, he was not held by police. Realizing it was time to leave town, Kui made his way to Augusta, Georgia, where he found shelter at a Salvation Army facility. By this point, news of Jessica Lunsford's disappearance had spread nationwide. In some reports, Kui was labeled as a suspect and his photo was shown on television asking for anyone with information to come forward. A secretary at the Salvation Army recognized him from TV and contacted the police, stating that he resembled a man wanted for questioning in the kidnapping of Jessica Lunsford. Kui was then taken into custody by Augusta police for not registering as a sex offender in Georgia. The Citrus County Florida Sheriff's Office was notified and two detectives, Scott Grace and Gary Atchison, traveled to Augusta to interview him about the disappearance of Jessica Lunsford. Kui appeared distressed and agitated during the several hours of questioning. Despite being pressed by Detective Grace and appealed to by Detective Atchison, Kui maintained his innocence and claimed no knowledge of Jessica's whereabouts. At one point in the interrogation, Kui was asked if he would take a lie detector test. He initially agreed, but then requested a lawyer. However, the detectives continued to question him without providing him legal representation. Eventually, after stating that his brain was, quote, fried, Kui confessed to abducting and murdering Jessica Lunsford, as well as revealed where her body could be found. In an audio recorded confession, Kui admitted to entering the Lunsford home at 3 a.m. on February 24th and taking Jessica from her bed. He initially intended to steal from the house, but acted on impulse when he saw the young girl. He ordered her to be quiet by saying, don't yell or nothing. She complied with his demands to follow him to his half-sister's house. This is where he proceeded to rape her multiple times throughout the night and the following morning. He then left for work at Billy's truck lot, leaving her locked in his closet with a television set positioned so she could watch news reports about herself all day. While being questioned by authorities, Kui admitted to drinking and using drugs on the night he kidnapped Jessica. He claimed he was in a drug-hazed state. He vaguely remembers cooking her a hamburger at some point during her abduction and forcing her to urinate in his closet to conceal her from his housemates. For three days, she was kept hidden in that closet. Even when authorities came to his trailer looking for him, they didn't bother to check the closet where Jessica was being held captive. But when Kui heard that detectives were searching for him, he panicked. Believing he needed to get rid of Jessica before getting caught, he made the decision, around three days after her abduction, to bury her alive. Later, it was discovered that he convinced Jessica to get in the garbage bags by promising her he would be taking her home. After being informed of Kui's confession, authorities in Homosasa were quickly notified. A team of investigators arrived at Dorothy Dixon's trailer on Snowbird Court. Following his directions, they located a shallow grave where Jessica's body was buried. She was found wearing her clothes inside two plastic garbage bags that had been tied shut and left in the ground. Her hands were bound, but she had managed to make two holes in the plastic with her fingers, likely trying to escape. When the bags were eventually removed, it was noticed that she had died while clutching onto her beloved purple dolphin. Her body was taken to the Leesburg morgue, where Dr. Stephen Cogswell performed an autopsy as a medical examiner for the 5th Judicial District. During the examination, it was discovered that Jessica had been placed into the first garbage bag upside down and then headfirst into the second one. Both bags were tightly knotted, leading Dr. Cogswell to believe that suffocation was the cause of death which could have taken between three to five minutes. Dr. Cogswell noted that Jessica's body was in a state of medium decomposition, suggesting that she passed away a few days after her abduction. Her fingernails were painted with peach-colored polish, and two exposed fingers appeared to be partially preserved. This indicated that Jessica had been alive when she was buried and had likely attempted to break out of the bags. Further investigation showed signs of sexual assault and it was estimated that this assault occurred within six hours before her death. Additionally, her digestive system was nearly empty, and it was believed that her last meal had been consumed anywhere from 12 hours up to four days before she died. This would mean that Jessica was not fed anything for the three days she was being held captive. Traces of cocaine were also present on her body, indicating that she had been in an environment where crack cocaine had been smoked. She had not ingested it herself, but the effects of being exposed to it were noticeable. 
On the 20th of March 2005, John Cui was booked into the Citrus County Jail in Lacanto, Florida, and put on suicide watch. Three of his housemates, Dorothy Dixon, Maddie Secord, and Matthew Dittrich, were charged with obstruction of justice for lying to the police. The fourth housemate, Jean Secord, who had not been at the house when detectives came looking for Cui, was charged with failure to pay child support. Coincidentally, Cui and Secord would share cells next to each other for six months while Cui was awaiting sentencing. The citizens of Homosasa were outraged, and everyone who had followed the case demanded justice. He will pay, Jessica's mother, Angela Bryant, told CNN after she learned that John Cui had confessed to killing her daughter. He will pay for hurting those children out there and my daughter. He deserves everything he gets coming to him. Jessica's father, Mark Lunsford, vacillated between vengeance and sorrow. She's home now, he told the St. Petersburg Times, his voice breaking. But when later interviewed by CNN, he looked into the camera and spoke directly to Cooey. I hope you rot in hell, Lunsford said. I hope you get the death penalty. On the 1st of April 2005, a grand jury indicted John Cooey on charges of first-degree murder, kidnapping, sexual battery, and burglary. Five days later, Cooey appeared in court and pleaded not guilty to the charges. The state declared that it would be seeking the death penalty in this case. Cooey was sent back to the county jail and held without bail. During his stay awaiting trial, corrections officers near Cooey's cell discussed personal concerns, unaware Cooey could hear them. The conversation touched on the fears of Officer Johnson leaving her child at daycare in reference to Cooey's crime. After Officer Johnson left, Cooey expressed to the other officer, Officer Slanker, that their conversation had hurt his feelings. Cooey would say, I don't appreciate people talking about me like that. I didn't mean to do what I did. I didn't mean to kill her. I never saw myself as someone who could do something like this. Despite his not guilty plea, Cooey once again admitted to killing Jessica Lunsford to the corrections officers. As Cooey's trial approached, finding an unbiased jury was challenging due to widespread media coverage. Judge Rick Howard sought jurors outside the crime's locale, selecting from Lake County to mitigate bias. Judge Howard had decided to exclude Cooey's confession to killing Jessica due to rights violations. He stated that Cooey's first request for legal representation should have been honored. This would make things difficult for the prosecution. Threats to jurors were made by some members of the public, which would force a venue change for the trial. Due to security concerns, most of the jury would have to stay anonymous in motels around the area for the duration of the trial. Ultimately, Cooey's trial was moved to Miami-Dade County, set for the 12th of February 2007. There was outrage from the community because there was a possibility that the change of venue to Miami-Dade could help Cooey's case. Urban jurors are generally considered more sympathetic to the defense. But, as the St. Petersburg Times pointed out, serial killer Ted Bundy's trial for the murders of two Florida State University co-eds had been moved from Tallahassee to Miami, and the Miami jury found Bundy guilty and sentenced him to death. Cooey's trial began in Miami on the 12th of February 2007. Evidence presented by the prosecution included DNA from Jessica's blood and Cooey's semen on the mattress in his bedroom. Jessica's fingerprints were also found inside his closet in the trailer. The testimony from investigators and jail guards at the trial of Cooey painted a chilling picture of the events leading up to Jessica's killing. Cooey, after his arrest, had made several confessions about the crime clarifying that his intention was never to kill Jessica, but that he had panicked as the police intensified their search. However, his statements to the two officers assigned to monitor him in his cell would contradict this. He had disclosed to them that he had been observing Jessica from his window for several days, meticulously planning his approach. On the night of the abduction, he deceitfully woke Jessica, claiming he would take her to see her father. A ruse designed to ensure her compliance. Jessica, innocently asking if she could bring her purple dolphin along, illustrated her trust and lack of suspicion. This detail seems to suggest that there was a calculated nature of Cooey's actions, ensuring that Jessica would leave quietly without alerting anyone in the house, not even Corky, the family dog. Further testimonies revealed that his half-sister and Dittrich were not only aware of Jessica's presence in the house, but had also interacted with her. This additional layer of complicity adds to the horror of the crime. 
The defense called experts who testified to Kui's chronic drug and alcohol abuse, long-standing mental illness and his suffering a lifetime of emotional abuse. The defense argued that Kui's below average IQ rendered him mentally handicapped, which according to a 2002 Supreme Court ruling would disqualify him from the death penalty. However, the judge ruled that Kui's IQ results were more around 78, eight points higher than the standard score for mental disability. Kui mostly passed the time at trial drawing with colored pencils. On the 7th of March, the jury found Kui guilty of all charges relating to the death of Jessica Lunsford, including first degree murder, kidnapping, burglary, and sexual battery. On the 11th of August, 2007, a Miami jury voted 10 to 2 that Kui be eligible for the death sentence. In the circuit court of the 11th, Judge Richard Howard, who had to stop more than once to compose himself as he read a graphic description of the crime, ruled that the facts of the crime vastly outweighed mitigating arguments put forward by Kui's attorneys, who, citing Kui's mental capacity, were requesting a sentence of life without the possibility of parole instead of death. He sentenced John Evander Kui to die for the brutal 2005 rape and murder of Jessica Lunsford only nine years old at the time of her murder. On the 30th of September 2009, John Evander Kui passed away in prison due to natural causes. According to CNN, a source close to the case confirmed that Kui's death was not a surprise and he had been dealing with health issues for some time. After news of Kui's passing reached Citrus County Sheriff Jeff Dossie, he held a press conference to address the situation. Ruth Lansford and Archie Lansford, Jessica's grandparents, reportedly felt a sense of relief as if a 1,000 pound weight had been lifted from their shoulders. Mark Lunsford, Jessica's father, was said to be going through an emotional roller coaster due to his daughter's upcoming 6th of October birthday. However, he did express feeling relieved, as the burden of worrying about Kui potentially appealing his sentence was now gone. While Sheriff Dossie admitted to feelings of satisfaction and relief, he also expressed disappointment that he was unable to witness Kui's execution firsthand. He stated, It was always one of my goals to be present and see him take his last breath. The case of Kui's death has not been disclosed. However, when asked if he knew, Sheriff Dossie mentioned hearing it could have been due to anal cancer and added that it seemed fitting. After the tragic loss of his daughter, Jessica, at the hands of a predator, Mark Lunsford took action to ensure that other children would not suffer the same fate. He tirelessly lobbied Florida lawmakers to pass stricter laws against sex offenders. Thanks to his efforts, a bill was drafted and passed into law soon after. The Jessica Lunsford Act mandates longer prison sentences for convicted sex offenders, requires electronic tracking for those on probation, and enforces the use of state databases by all probation officials to prevent offenders from escaping detection by law enforcement. The law was signed into effect by Governor Jeb Bush, providing greater protection for children in Florida. I had a hard time going through and researching this case, as it involves a child, and reading the senseless brutal acts committed against her was deeply, deeply unpleasant. Either way, the fact that the community took a step to help prevent such cases in the future is at least one positive. What are your thoughts? The fact that the police were careless in catching John early in his life is something that did frustrate me. After an attack on a five-year-old child, you would think that the authorities would be a lot more careful in how they manage a person. But being careless and letting him rejoin society without anyone to hold him accountable was... What were they thinking? Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, then be sure to give the channel a like, share and subscribe. Take care and see you next time.